In today's episode of EU4, you'll see why Korea is definitely the best country for province development. This is possible by combining two ingredients. Korea has many bonuses that reduce the cost of province development and an endless amount of monarchy points from tributaries. Additionally, I'll show you how to double these points for free, however, this will require a bit of unconventional gameplay. Greetings imperialists, Lucas here. The beginning will be very peaceful. For about 20 years, we won't engage in wars, so we'll turn off army maintenance and fort maintenance. Unless you see Jiangsu troops near your border, then I recommend turning on that fort. But currently, we have a guaranteed 5 years of peace with this country. We'll immediately assign rivals on the international scene. I'm ordering my fleet to hunt pirates in Nippon, because soon this small island will become a pirate republic. This 20-year period of peace in Korea is due to its unique government form. Inward focus? Something like that. Waging wars is unprofitable then, and we can change this once every 20 years. Besides, the Korean government form itself has big bonuses for province development and cheaper advisors. Remember this Korean province. This one. We have a nice bonus here, which we can lose if the religion in this province changes. It used to give institutions, but I haven't noticed this in my gameplay anymore. Probably Paradox nerfed it because it was really strong. Initially, I have a lot of autonomy in Korea due to historical turmoil, I'm not an expert on that. Privileges for estates are completely standard here. Points, cheaper advisors and all the rest just to achieve over 50% equilibrium. I'm also performing a trick best on a cheaper military advisor. We have an incredibly strong ruler whose name I can't pronounce. Here's a fun fact. The first two traits of our ruler are always the same. The third is random and I'm very unlucky. I'll be getting rid of successors so one will probably fall off a bike soon. Korea also has several very good national decisions. Cheaper technology, definitely. More money, more manpower, definitely. And fortifications for a certain province, Jinju. We don't need this, at least for now. Later, we'll be able to change our culture to Sino-Korean, joining the Chinese cultural group, which is gigantic. We set it to five and off we go. For now, I'm getting rid of the cavalry in the army. It will be useless for us currently. I'll also be paying tribute to Ming for the next 20 years or until cannons are invented. Then we'll fight for freedom. My court currently looks like this, and I'll gradually increase the level of my advice. At the beginning, I'll focus on having as many points as possible, either administrative or military. For now, I'll leave it without focus. As usual, I forgot about the monument, and Korea has a very powerful one. We quickly increase stability to level 1 to start growing our prosperity. Oh no, my heir tragically died. This time, I had nothing to do with it. The state council, one of the highest organs of our government, the old privy council, still seems to have ties to old dynasty. Honestly, I want to keep this council because it offers really nice bonuses although just for five years. Missions. I completely forgot about the Korean missions. I'm getting old. The most important mission is not the first one, but rather the middle one. It focuses on economically developing the country and appeasing the peasantry to prevent an uprising. You might remember a similar government form from the era of Sejong's sons, right? But here, it's unique to our ruler, who seems to have produced many heirs. I have an obvious successor in mind, whose name I think I can pronounce correctly. Boo! We aim to be the first to advance in technology to get maximum innovation bonuses. All technologies. I'm shifting my court's focus to administrative. Regarding the revolt, I thought I had 50 years to prepare for. It turns out I only have 20. A little mistake. First, I'll focus on developing Korea's trade areas and building temples. Introducing the Renaissance institutions in a certain province is profitable early on. If you're focused on increasing your income first, I recommend the Jinju province or your capital. In Pyongyang, I had an event that reduced development costs, so I want to introduce institutions there. This province has grain, allowing us to stockpile a significant amount of manpower for the future. I'll develop this province with military points until I can upgrade ports, then alternate between military and diplomatic points. I'll improve infrastructure and repeat this cycle until the Renaissance institutions are introduced. I'm adopting innovative ideas in Korea, as nothing suits this country better. Because if you look at the icons themselves, you'll see how many things are repeated for us. Or you might consider economic ideas, but they're just okay. Okay, and what I'll add to these innovations, you'll see in a moment. Remember, innovation reduces the cost of everything you spend monarchy points on, including province development. The first development from the era definitely goes to tax bonuses. Jianzu attacked me, but that's not bad. We'll win this war soon by defeating their troops at our mountain fortress a few times until their manpower is depleted. Once I introduce the fifth technology level, we'll have significantly better units. For now, we'll humble Jianzu and take as much money from them as possible. Since I'm a bit ahead in 
technology, it's a good time to start developing our provinces where I need to introduce six development points. I issue a development edict. This time, I prioritize diplomatic points for production and trade. Completing a prospering economy gives us nice bonuses for building and developing our provinces, stabilizing Korea's situation shortly after. There will be no peasant revolt. The other economic mission bonuses are also great and worth obtaining as soon as possible. As for our fleet's doctrine, focus on naval battles. If you're playing with heavy ships, I recommend this naval doctrine. If you're using galleys, focus on them. I'm choosing heavy ships because they currently perform better. In a sense, after a very short time, we are already earning a lot in Korea and see how cheaply we can develop in our capital now despite having a development level of 25. With the first era's development, I honestly think aggressive expansion might be useful for us and I prefer to save the golden age for the next period when we'll have so-called religious wars. Unless you want to develop your country as quickly as possible and increase its development, it could also work quite well in the first era. This idea tempts me a bit. I choose innovation in all events because I already have a lot of it and want even more. More, yet I've chosen inward focus again for the next 20 years. I introduced technology in Korea very cheaply. I can now build workshops, so I'm developing every province. I reform bureaucracy and of course implement higher taxes. The alternative I will change in the next era is very important and you should guess why. And you know what? I'll do it. I'll test how the golden age works if used during the era of discovery because I'm really interested in how much I can develop the country before my first war with Ming. We currently have 189 developers so we've grown a bit, but we're still a bit short compared to Ming. A little bit. I won't introduce technology prematurely, but we'll keep an eye on this icon. When it turns red, then I'll introduce the technology. Wow, my provinces are so cheap to develop, I'll prioritize developing my provinces using diplomatic points first, then military points, because money and the army must align. This allowed me to complete a mission for Korea's development. Reaching a development level of 15 and also developing our infrastructure, since I have plenty of governing capacity. I might lower infrastructure someday, but probably not. For now, I'll enjoy these bonuses. Once I've used all the points for development, we must remember to switch to feudal taxes to significantly increase our tax income. This resulted in an additional 14 gold in income over five years. I also completed a mission to settle the north, ensuring 100% of Korea in Korea. We are earning enough to afford at least level three advisors and to change our council's focus to military. We'll need more manpower. I'm also building a flagship, a heavy flagship with standard bonuses. Once we've built economic buildings everywhere profitable, we can either build manufactories, of which we can build two, or expand our country's manpower, which I'll do in every province. Importing tea is interesting. With the seventh technology level, it's time to choose another idea for Korea. With innovative ideas, two military ideas scale very well, offensive ideas for quick fortress captures, or quality ideas for strong infantry. This is a really tough choice because Korea gets an infantry bonus for full development, which is a very strong combo. But we know EU4 is a fortress siege simulator, so I'll go with offensive ideas. As I plan to start conquests in four years, I'll begin preparing my army, though it won't be very large. So a 2410 composition will suffice for now, the rise of neo Confucians. In the late 15th and early 16th century, the previous political stability of the Joseon Korean Kingdom was disrupted by the emergence of a new group known as the Neo-Confucianists. Yes, I must admit, they really disrupted the stability of my country. To get Get rid of this, we need to complete this mission. The worst part will be waiting for events, as it might take up to 50 years or longer if you are unlucky. In the year 1484, I must admit that my Korea is starting to feel suffocated on this tiny peninsula. We've achieved over 340 development points, which is quite a lot considering we haven't literally conquered anything, as you can see by comparing the situation before and now. Despite this, the development costs for our provinces remain dramatically low. However, I've started to conquer, so I'm changing my government's stance for better bonuses. Since my army limit has increased, I've reorganized my troops into a new formation 1447 and will unite for bigger battles. I've sent spies to build a spy network in Jiangsu and Bing expanded my army to its limit and ensured no province on our peninsula is less developed than level 10, aiming for 15 and then 20. Eventually, we're starting our campaign, which will be tougher than planned. And we won't pay tributes anymore. I'm also significantly expanding my navy, claiming coasts of Japan for future conquests. After the fourth religious reform, and despite having nearly 100% innovativeness, I'm strengthening our Confucian bureaucracy. We've adopted policies for faster siege, reducing the time from 30 to 16 days, speeding up our conquests. The worst part of wars with Oirat is pronouncing its name because someone will correct me in the comments. The second worst part is occupying the country. We can't risk a carpet siege because the 
enemy quickly responds. I defeated Jianzu's entire army, which had passed through my mountain fortresses and looted my country, but that's no longer a problem. It's also not a problem that I'm no longer a tributary of Ming. With the 8th technology level, I can build regiment camps, increasing my army size. Conquering Jianzu in one war turned out to be impossible, but we've finally become a great power and Ming considers us a rival, which doesn't bother me. To replenish our manpower faster after wars, I change edicts to speed up the process. 25% faster is always something, money isn't an issue, and our manpower growth is quite good. I'm starting my invasion of Ashikage. I start with naval battles to dominate the Japanese fleet, which is usually stronger than ours, but this time I completely defeat it. I forgot about transport ships since I'm only conquering an island. I've managed a social balance in dealing with Neo-Confucianism, angering everyone equally. The war starts with setting a trap for the Shogun and the death of my great leader. As Korea, I've noticed how cheap advisors are. I've successfully trapped the majority of the Japanese army on Ainu, blocking the strait and easily taking over major Japanese capitals. I'm waiting for Ming to reform before attacking, as they'll be an easier target. I'm not rushing the conquest of Japan, just gaining territorial claims and some cash. I've also taken a province to build a fortress, cutting off the Japanese army in future wars. For the first time, in a while, I'm struggling with having nearly a thousand of each monarch points, and it feels wasteful to spend them on technology development. So I'll increase stability, reduce inflation, and sell land. I'm switching back to development edicts, although I should have waited another three years because colonialism is coming soon. For now, I'll develop my province very slowly. I'm also granting privileges for faster religious harmonization since I finally have something to harmonize. Initially there were animists, but now we have Shinto as well. We've also dominated trade in the Japan region with 60% of the shares, almost all mine. Colonialism has arrived and I've immediately embraced it and expanded my army to 80,000. I thought I solved all my problems with Neo-Confucianism, but that was just the second of three events. The Korean peninsula looks excellent with over 500 development. In 1501, Ming implemented another reform, sealing their fate, and I'll complete all my missions to conquer territories from them. Oh, I forgot about the foothold in Japan. I'll quell any rebellions I can and start the invasion aiming not for Beijing, but for the Mandate of Heaven. It's not about the Mandate itself, but conquering as many provinces as possible. Our armies are almost even, but since they have a negative Mandate, they suffer huge disadvantages. I'll first strike at Shenyang, and then head straight for Beijing. My fleet is already stationed here, and I don't see Ming's fleet. The Siege of 16 Days went great. We're scorching the earth, so if Ming comes to our fortresses, we can burn the territory there too, especially in the Mountain Fortress. Oh, Ming's troops finally showed up. Meaning Meaning they'll attack my mountain fortresses while I capture their capital. Time for the first major battle. Ming's 80,000 troops stand no chance against us though. They inflicted surprisingly high casualties on us. However, it's much better this time. Still, I have ongoing manpower issues, so I'm switching feudal taxes to increase manpower in my main provinces, which boosts my monthly volunteer recruitment. We've broken through Ming's first line of defense, so I'm moving on to capture more fortresses. In the first war with Ming, I took the maximum amount of money and all the key states from the north. Most importantly, we need a few provinces. If I remember correctly, it will be Nanjing and probably Canton, or the province next to it, which I can never remember. For now, I'll take Canton. That's enough for now. The losses were significant. I want to maintain my expansionist stance in Korea. Now that we're free, we can start establishing new tributaries, and I recommend doing it as soon as possible. From now on, my Korea will wage war against every neighbor, expanding in all directions as peace treaties expire. Regarding the provinces I needed, I remembered correctly that Canton was the third province. Time to establish a tributary. I'm stealing from Ming, which will join this war. Most importantly, we want to remove Ming from the war as soon as possible to attack them again as soon as possible. With Ming, I made a white piece to have only a five-year peace period. Alternatively, you can take only money from them for a seven-year peace. Jianzu was left with one province, so I just made them my tributary. Or not, which is quite strange. In Korea, we can have Ashikage as our tributary, but not Nifkech. I want to conquer Ashikage as soon as possible, so I'm ending the war with them. For our country's third idea, humanistic would be good since Confucians need them. Alternatively, if you want to conquer more, I recommend diplomatic and you know what I want to conquer
conquer more. Time for the second war with Ming, this time it should go much faster. It would have been even quicker if we already had the religious era because then Ming would explode and we could conquer smaller countries. But I don't have the next era yet. In wars with Ming, I always focus on capturing their capital first, which really advances the war. After expanding into Haixi, we can now make further claims on the rest of Manchuria. Essentially, I can conquer everything here. The Ming army doesn't stand a chance against us. A plus three diplomat for 072? Incredible. Our empire is growing slowly, transforming into a kingdom. Or rather, an empire. We've gained control over the Yellow River. I love that I can annex all the tribes in this region. One war and everything is mine. Dealing with an unwanted vassal is annoying. When can I get rid of it? This concludes matters in Manchuria. Now, after uniting Manchuria and making initial incursions into China, I suggest releasing the smallest, least desirable province as a separate country you've previously conquered. This province should not border any potential tributary of yours. I'll release Jiangsu from a mountainous province and then make them my tributary. You can see a list of potential countries to release in the diplomatic panel. Welcome to our new tributary. For now, they can only give us money or manpower since they are too small, having less than 32 development points. If they had more, they could give us monarchy points, but they don't. I wonder how many tributaries I can release from Japan. The conquests continue. Subsequent wars with Japan were not challenging. The enemy fell into my traps continuously. The reformation era has begun, a time when I won't gain much splendor. However, there's a good chance Ming will collapse soon, which is advantageous. Advisors are so cheap in Korea that I upgrade them immediately. One third of Japan is under our control. It's time to release our first tributary in Japan. I guess there's no better place for this because everywhere else, oh, okay, that was a better province, oh no, but not much better. It's also a good time to switch from regional councils to representative of the crown, allowing us to take points from our tributaries. Though it's not much with a hundred tributaries, it adds up. I want to continue conquering. The biggest downside to this tactic is having to manually change edicts in all provinces from development to manpower, or removing them altogether, which is necessary but tedious. Why isn't there a single button for this? Ming begins to collapse. It's unfortunate that Ashikaga is bankrupt. The south has liberated its Itself, which is nice, but I lack a Kasu's belly. It seems someone has defied the shogunate. I'm now taking a lot of land from Ming and soon will take over the Mandate of Heaven. This introduces a new social class, the eunuchs causing issues with crown land, but we'll manage. I dislike this group since every privilege increases corruption. However, I don't have to grant them anything. We've become the emperor of China and our support is growing. The stability from tributaries, though not many yet, will increase. We're facing a disaster, empire of China in name only due to cultural issues. Fortunately, we've conquered enough development to change our primary culture to Sino-Korean, joining the Chinese cultural group and averting the disaster. Makes sense, right? As the Chinese emperor, we can now conquer using the Casus Belli for uniting China, essentially having the mandate of heaven without actually having it. As the Chinese emperor, we got another part of the tree. Yes, it's available for all Chinese emperors. Even if you are playing as Poland, an ally with the Chinese emperor, you will get this part of the tree. I'm also harmonizing the Shinto religion, which gives us a 10% infantry combat ability. Playing as Korea with a focus on quality is very strong. Meritocracy is slowly increasing, nicely complementing our cheap advisors, making them better. I'll also start building Chinese monuments now that we have an acceptable culture aiming to upgrade each at least to the first level. We aim to quickly implement further reforms, as some are very powerful, especially for playing with tributaries. We also have Chinese decrees, which are very powerful. I'll mostly use the decree for reducing development costs, coring provinces, and raising taxes, although I should have done this in the previous era, so I'll stick to this decree. Wow, there are way more of them than I remembered. Okay, I've increased the mandate growth. I must have it. The Ming Dynasty falls and they flee to Taiwan. Give me that mandate. Oh, they've already fled to Taiwan. That's kind of them. Fleeing to Taiwan didn't do them any good. I still got it. This allowed me to end tame the dragon. By the way, I got a lot of claims on all of China. So if you don't want to take over the mandate, you can also go this route. The first duchy fell or the second. And you know what's the best part about conquering these provinces? I don't have to core them. As the emperor, I reclaim what's mine and another duchy disappears. And the first reform I'll implement is establish Lifan Yuan. It 
further reduces our coring costs, which will soon be useful in Japan. Then something literally strange happened. Divea just split into two nations. Let's conquer them. I wonder if I took the mandate from Ming too quickly. It hasn't exploded yet and probably won't. So I might need two or three wars to fully conquer it. If your newly conquered tributary isn't too loyal, remember you can send them gifts. It costs us nothing and they'll stay loyal. We need to start planning our conquest path through the Philippines. You can reach all the way to Brunei through these islands and to Malacca. Create more tributaries here and in Indochina. I'll soon conquer all this and release more tributaries. This can get us dozens of new tributaries. Right now I have 13. Unlucky. Meanwhile, the Korean peninsula is getting greener. Shu has risen. Great. Let more countries emerge. Even Ryukyu will be my tributary. Yay, more countries are emerging. Great. Now nearly half of Japan is conquered. Meanwhile, Ming has started to seriously fall apart. So it's time to conquer it. I mean, reclaim those territories for us. Finally, I can deal with the eunuchs, at least start the process. And now we can establish the Great Korea's Supervisory Agency. The censorate is a highly effective and influential branch of our government under the direct authority of the emperor. Its primary role is extend the authority and vigilance of the emperor to all the branches of administration. Ooh, secret police. And I won't lie, we get several bonuses for establishing this council. For me, the most important is probably solving the whole Neo-Confucianism issue. Before the last war with Ming, I'll focus on capturing the rest of the North and cutting off Ming from other countries so no one else attacks them. Actually, I can conquer it now. Interesting, Ming ceases to exist. Now it's time to finally release my vassals, I mean tributaries. I even managed to make Ming, which I released again, my tributary. And that's about it. I've clicked through all the countries, although I still have a few that I could theoretically release. I don't know from which province, because I always return it to someone else who already exists. Essentially, we'd now gain more tributaries in the Philippines. Brunei, Malacca, more in Indochina, and a lot in India. Each of them will give me military points to develop my Korea. And as for the south of Korea, every province, every area here has at least a 30 development level. Yes, I'm focusing on developing this just for fun. It's not optimal. With all the bonuses, aside from those from ideas that I could get, our development costs look like this. They're very low, simply the amount of bonuses bonuses we can get in Korea is overwhelming. It's so cheap, I could even develop the capital further, even though it's almost at level 50. And so I've developed my country to the point where we can further reform our bureaucracy. Depending on what we decide, we get such a bonus, and now we're introducing a dual trade system achieved thanks to our tributaries. Now each tributary gives us an extra point, and after all this, I can restore the reform that gives us another point back, because honestly, the eunuch reform is terrible. I just have to change them again to give me points. And so in December, we have 218 of those points. 281, that gives us about four to five free mana points a month, and that's only with 24 tributaries. On YouTube, I saw a video where a guy had over a hundred tributaries. It really made cosmic amounts of mana, which could be used to develop Korea, and essentially, this is now an endless bonus to monarchy points. And our Korea looks like this. Nice, isn't it? In this episode, I'll show you how to create the unique kingdom of Sardinia, Piedmont, from Savoy, a less popular but very powerful Italian duchy. Savoy and Sardinia have very unique national ideas, which allow us to very quickly reduce the aggressive expansion we gain. This makes it one of the more pleasant countries to create the Roman Empire with.